Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Our guest today is Dr. Hitesh Amin. He's a bariatric surgeon with Doctors Community Hospital. And today we're talking about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. It is what the Sisters for Fitness organization is based on. We are trying to decrease the number of obese people here in Prince George's County and around the country. Welcome so much. Thank Welcome. you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Dr. Amin, how large would you say the obesity epidemic is in this country? Yeah, unfortunately, it's quite a large um, problem in this country. Um, looking at statistics nationwide, 66% uh, of Americans are either overweight or obese. So if you divide the Americans into three groups, only a third of us are normal weight, the other third are overweight, and then unfortunately, the, uh, the last third will be more uh, obese. And how bad is the problem in this county? Yeah, unfortunately, um, Maryland is one of the, it does have the designation of being one of the more um, obese states in the, in the United States. Um, unfortunately, the Southeast United States is more disproportionately affected. And within the uh, state of Maryland, we're the second most obese county, Prince George's after Baltimore County. Now, you're the medical director of the bariatric center at Doctors Community Hospital. Who are you seeing coming through your door for the most part? Males, females, what age group are we talking about? Yeah, so we do see a large proportion of female patients. Uh, typically, we'll see about 80% female patients. Um, and the age group is middle age, about 25 to 55 years of age. When, at what point in your journey should you consider your type of surgery? At what, uh, at what point should you be 100 pounds overweight? At what point should you really sit down and say, hey, nothing else is working? So I think um, there, there are two ways of looking at it. Number one is the scale. Um, if you are overweight, as you said, by about 50 to 100 pounds in that range, you need to start thinking about whether you qualify for surgery. Um, certainly, if you've developed any obesity-related medical conditions, weight loss surgery makes sense as well because you can qualify at a lower weight. And those conditions would be things like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, even sleep apnea. So if you have any of those conditions, even if you are just beginning uh, or, or just overweight by about 30 or 40 pounds, you may still qualify for surgery. But you don't want to think about surgery until after you've tried all non-surgical attempts. So meeting with your doctor, maybe um, obtaining consultation from a nutritionist, uh, working with a gym or personal trainer. Those are all things that you really want to try first before you jump into something as serious as surgery. What do you say to the critics who, who would argue that, well, all you need to do is watch your diet and do more exercise? Well, unfortunately, um, the human body, our biology, doesn't really allow for that simplistic approach. Um, our bodies, unfortunately, are designed to prevent weight loss. It's actually considered to be a survival mechanism. Um, if you take the humans that lived 50 to 100,000 years ago, they lived in areas of significant scarcity. And weight loss was basically a prelude to dying of starvation. And so we are endowed with mechanisms that actually force our weights to go back up after we have some initial weight loss. So it may be easy over the short run to lose 10, 15 pounds, but eventually your body will put a halt to that and actually force your weight to come back up. At what, or what particular types of, of, of surgeries are available? with this because there's more than one we think of uh, <coughs> weight loss surgery surgery rather and we think of one thing I'm sure there are a variety of different types of absolutely things you can do. yeah absolutely um, in the old days uh, maybe about 40 years ago there was one option it was called a gastric bypass yes since then we've developed several new surgical techniques um, and really there are a lot of techniques out there that are both approved and experimental so uh, I probably can't go through all of them, but I will uh, touch on the, the most common four procedures. I mentioned gastric bypass, and that's sort of the old man uh, gold standard operation, still commonly done around the, in the United States. Um, in addition to that, about 15 years ago, um, we developed a device called a gastric band. And this is an implant that's designed to go in around the top of the stomach and actually help reduce um, how much a patient might eat. Um, more recently, we've um, renewed interest in some older operations, 
and kind of refine them. So the most commonly done surgery now in the United States is an operation known as the sleeve gastrectomy. And that operation basically involves trimming the stomach down into a small tube or a small sleeve, and that's how it gets its name. And that operation actually came from a larger operation known as the duodenal switch. And so since sleeves have become very popular, duodenal switch has also come back to the forefront as um, a viable weight loss option. So at our program, we offer all four of those choices to our patients. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show as well, my sister had the surgery uh, back in December, the sleeve. Mm -hmm. She's lost 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. She looks absolutely wonderful, has more energy, and she feels like herself again That's after great. all these years of, of battling the weight. Um, with Let's go back a little bit and talk about the gastric bypass. What exactly is the process? With the gastric bypass, you're actually cutting out a portion of the person's stomach? Um, <clears throat> so the sleeve, you do cut out part of the stomach. Actually, okay. in the bypass, you leave everything intact, but you're actually really just rearranging the plumbing, if you want to think of it that way. Okay. We trim down the stomach to a very small pouch, but we don't remove any of it. We simply partition it off so you have a very small stomach, and then the remaining stomach is actually no longer used, but it remains behind in the body. Um, that new smaller stomach is then connected directly to the small bowel. So food that you eat will then pass through the stomach into the small bowel and basically take a shortcut. And that shortcut prevents your body from absorbing all the calories that somebody might eat. So you have sort of two components. You have the restriction that you get from eating less because you have a smaller stomach and you get malabsorption because now you've shortened the length of the intestinal tract or at least the effective length of the intestinal tract even though you haven't removed anything from the body. And you explained a little bit about the sleeve. Yes. And, and the sleeve works um, almost as effectively as the bypass. They're, they're essentially considered to be similar operations as far as effectiveness. So you can lose the same amount of weight with both surgeries. But the sleeve is a much more simplistic operation in terms of technique. You simply place the tube into the stomach to help us gauge the size of the stomach that we're leaving behind. And then the remainder of the stomach is simply cut and removed away from the body. Um, what that does is it gives you a very narrow, thin stomach. So again, only allows you to eat a small amount of food. But we also know that by removing the stomach, we actually remove cells that produce hormones. And, and I'm going to generically call these hunger hormones. And what it does is it actually suppresses that desire of the body to bring your weight back up to where it used to be. As I mentioned before, if you were to voluntarily cut your calories, your body will sort of notice that and it will go through this hunger response and it's mediated by these hunger hormones. The hunger response then forces your weight back up. If we can suppress that with surgery, and that's what seems to be happening in the, gast uh, in the sleeve gastrectomy, patients can effectively lose weight without that rebound weight gain. Okay, and the lap band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lap band is actually a commercial um, available medical device. Um, there are actually a couple manufacturers that make gastric bands, so mm -hmm. generically we refer to them as gastric bands. And those simply are implants that go in around the top of the stomach. And they're designed to basically um, limit the amount of food that you can eat to a very small area of the stomach above the band. Eventually that food will be broken down and passed through the band and get absorbed through the normal uh, mechanism of digestion. So. Uh, it doesn't do anything to rearrange the intestines. We're not removing anything. We're simply placing an implant into the body to help reduce your calorie intake. Is one procedure more successful than the other? Have you seen over the years? So the term that we use is percent of excess body weight loss. So those will be different depending on the procedure. On the far end is the duodenal switch. It gives you the most excess body weight loss. So think of it this way, if you're 100 pounds overweight, the duodenal switch will give you about 80 pounds of weight loss for somebody 100 pounds overweight. On the other end of the spectrum is the gastric band. It seems to be the least effective, and it'll give you about 40 pounds of weight loss uh, for somebody who's 100 pounds overweight. And then the sleeve and the gastric bypass are right in the middle between those two, around 65 to 70 uh, pounds worth of weight loss. How long is the workup for this? How do you choose what patients will work with what procedures? Yeah, so the most important um, factor is the patient's starting weight. In fact, it's not just the weight, it's the weight and their height. And we calculate a number known as the body mass index, or BMI. And that number is critical for us to determine which procedure would tend to work the best. Of course, we take into account the patient factors, um, 
patient's age, their comorbid conditions, what other medical problems they have. And then we customize a solution to that patient. Um, patients who are heavier tend to need more aggressive operations or more uh, operations with a lot more malabsorption. Patients who are a little bit on the lower scale with BMI, they can get away with something like a gastric band and do just fine. And how long is the workup? I'm sure you don't say, well, you uh, may be a candidate for this and a week later no, you're able not. to get a procedure. How long does this take and what is the process? Do they receive some sort of psychological counseling, some sort of nutritional counseling? How does that work? Absolutely. So um, in order for weight loss surgery to work, it should be understood that patients will have to change their lifestyle. Simply going in and doing the surgery will probably lead to very little weight loss. So it's the weight loss plus the lifestyle change that's really critical to success. So in order to make sure patients have all the tools, all the key education that they need to get success from their surgery, we put them through a preoperative preparation program. Programs typically last between three to six months. Um, it involves you know, registered dietitians, um, psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, it involves coming to group sessions and meeting with um, uh, people who help with behavior modification. We even have fitness experts who come in and teach uh, patients about fitness. Um, and all of those tools together are designed, again, to change the patient's lifestyle. If we can affect positive lifestyle change, the surgery has a very strong um, track record of success. For patients who are unable or unwilling to make those changes, the surgery simply doesn't work. And that's really the other part of the workup process. I know a lot of patients feel frustrated with the three to six months that they have to spend going to the classes, but it's, a, it's actually a very good litmus test for us to determine who's gonna actually be a good patient and who may not be. Those who aren't immediately good patients, we may have to work a little harder with those patients to make sure that they fully grasp what they're getting into and make sure that they're well-educated so that they have the best chance of success after surgery. What are the dangers of the surgeries? Well, let's remember this is surgery. So anything that can happen in any surgery um, can happen in a bariatric surgery. Bleeding, infection, uh, blood clots such as in the legs. Um, some people have had blood clots that travel to the lungs. Um, you could also experience side effects from the operations itself. So people who have malabsorptive surgeries such as the gastric bypass and the duodenal switch, they may have uncomfortable side effects such as abdominal pain and cramps. They may go on in the future to develop things like bowel obstructions uh, or hernias. So these are all things that I can say fortunately don't happen very often, but they are critical um, complications to understand. And we do spend a lot of time with our patients to make sure we explain those complications to them and let them know the frequency or the likelihood that something like that might happen so they can make an informed decision for themselves. Do you have cases in which the people gain the weight back? Yep, unfortunately, um, you know, weight regain, I will say, is a fact of life in weight loss surgery. Um, while the numbers, longitudinal studies have shown us that probably about 80% of patients will have excellent weight loss results, 20% may not lose much weight at all um, and, and fall short of their weight loss goals. Um, if we stretch that time frame out to eight to 10 years, um, it may be as high as 30 or 40% may start to regain their weight. If you look at that subgroup of people who've regained their weight, almost 80% of those people we tend to categorize as people who haven't really been able to affect the lifestyle changes. So that's why we really focus on the front end and make sure that we educate patients uh, as adequately as we can to make sure that they have the best chance of success because we know that that lifestyle change is really the key to, to long-term success. Let's talk post-surgery. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can't immediately go out and have a cheeseburger. No. What does post-surgery look like? What will your life look like the uh, first few weeks after the yeah. procedures? So um, usually patients get discharged within 48 or 72 hours of their surgery. So they're not in the hospital very long. Uh, and that is different from just a few years ago where patients spent almost five days or a week in the hospital. But now we've gotten the length of stay down to about two or three nights. Usually people, again, we do um, only minimally invasive surgery at our hospital, so most people have minimal pain. They can get by with some over-the-counter pain medicine. They need to take it easy, but they'll not be bed bound. They're not gonna be limited in um, you know, daily activities with the exception of strenuous activity. We prohibit patients from going out and doing any strenuous exercise. 
and they can't lift anything heavier than 10 pounds. But luckily that only lasts for about two weeks. After that, patients start to feel themselves again. They usually can return to work and they can usually return to um, vigorous physical exercise. Do the first few weeks include uh, having pretty much a liquid diet? We do. We place the patients on liquid diets for at least two weeks and then we see them back um, during their post-op period a couple times to see how they're tolerating that. Um, everybody will tolerate um, liquids um, at different rates so some patients will need to be on a liquid diet for four weeks or maybe even as long as six weeks. Other patients um, after two weeks are ready to move on to solid food because they're just feeling better and, and we can advance them a little bit more quickly. But two weeks after surgery, pretty much everybody needs to be on a liquid diet and then we can slowly start advancing the patient based on their individual tolerance of, of food. What support system do you guys put in place for people post-surgery? Yeah, so um, our facility has a support group which we have once a month. Um, and in these support groups, we look to mix up the various um, supports that we can provide. One that we do is that we will invite other medical professionals to come speak to bariatric patients. A common problem after surgery is excess skin, so we've often had plastic surgeons come in and speak to our patients about um, the ins and outs of having plastic surgery. Um, we may have a round table where post-op patients will sit around and discuss a specific topic. Um, other times we may even have educational opportunities. We'll have fitness instructors come in and, and have another class. Um, in fact, I'm actually scheduled to give a cooking class in a couple months to our, uh, to our post-op patients so that they can learn how to prepare meals for themselves, educate themselves about good nutrition, what works um, for somebody who's had weight loss surgery and, and what they need to avoid. So we try and mix it up and offer significant support. And of course, um, we follow the patients very closely. Um, during the first year, patients can expect to come to see us about every three months after their operation. And then we start to space those out. But regular follow-up with your surgeon or the practice and regular attendance of support groups has been shown to positively impact your results. And I want to emphasize, uh, as you just did, that the surgery is not it. You've got to do a couple of other things. You've got to make sure your nutrition. Absolutely. Uh, that you're following proper nutrition guides and also that you do the physical exercise as well. That's absolutely correct. Um, weight loss surgery by itself is going to be very limited. Uh, you may get some early success um, and uh, eventually the lifestyle that led you to become obese in the first place will catch up with you if you don't make a change. So positive change, leading a healthy lifestyle, understanding adequate nutrition, avoiding the triggers that makes one eat or overeat is, is re really critical to understand. So if those lifestyle changes can't be implemented, then weight loss surgery is, is really destined to fail. So it's really critical that patients understand that before they go in for surgery. Because if you can't or you're unwilling to make those lifestyle changes, then really why bother? Now you um, do something once a month at the hospital for people who may be interested. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, actually we do them twice a month and these are uh, free seminars that we offer. And the seminars are really nothing more than educational opportunities for people who might be interested in learning more about obesity and obesity surgery or weight loss surgery. Um, they're free to the public. They're, it does require registration, but it's free to come and listen. And I personally hold the seminars. Um, and they're a great opportunity to learn about all the things that we just discussed today. The types of surgeries, what's life like after surgery, what are the potential complications, what are the potential benefits that I could gain from surgery. So it's a wonderful opportunity. We do them twice a week. We typically do them in our office. We have a fairly large uh, waiting area. We can accommodate, you know, 20 to 30 people and oftentimes we have, you know, standing room only. And it is a wonderful opportunity for patients to learn more about weight loss surgery. How do you get people to set realistic goals as far as weight loss is concerned? You're not going to drop 70 pounds in two weeks. Right. And I think that comes back to education. Um, when patients come to meet me, it's not just about having a consult to say that, yes, you can have surgery or no, you cannot. It's really about helping the patient understand the full scope of what's about to happen. Setting appropriate weight loss goals is an important part of the conversation that we had. As you mentioned, um, also discussing 
potential complications. What medical benefits am I likely to get? That's another big part of the conversation that I have with each and every patient. And that's a tailored discussion that we have back in the consult room. Because uh, every patient may be looking for different benefits and every patient may only be able to attain specific benefits. Um, we can't offer everything to everybody. So we want to make sure we understand exactly what's bothering that patient, what that patient's specific medical problems are, and what options we have to offer to help that patient. For example, if you have an obese patient who is dealing with diabetes, what's the chance that that diabetes is going to go away as a result of, of the surgery and, and losing that weight? Yeah, um, so weight loss surgery has really um, shown itself to be one of the best long-term treatments for obesity, uh, excuse me, for diabetes. Now, everybody's um, resolution rate is gonna be a little bit different. It really depends on how long they've been diabetic, how severe their diabetes is, and of course, what procedure they choose. And that's a big part of the conversation to determine what the patient's specific diabetes condition is all about and then tailoring a treatment plan to that patient. Are there people who just can't be helped? Yeah, unfortunately, I do turn patients away from time to time. Um, of course, anybody who's not going to be able to tolerate an operation can't have weight loss surgery. They can't have any surgery. Um, there are other patients that could be excellent surgical candidates, but just aren't able to make the lifestyle changes for one reason or another, and, and without being judgmental, you know, we try and um, help patients understand, you know, what is really required. And, and I've had strange responses to, you know, that type of a discussion. I had one patient get up and walk out because she said she could never quit sodas, which is one of the requirements for weight loss surgery. I've had other patients say, my job is just too hectic. I can't take time out to work out. Um, and so patients need to reach a point in their lives where they say, my weight and my health is more important than these other factors that, that I am committed to. Um, and when they reach those goals, they may come back, and, and I hope they do come back. Uh, but unfortunately, there are those that are too far um, injured and damaged from years of obesity, or they've uh, developed other medical conditions that make it, make it unsafe for them to have an operation. You were just mentioning um, sugar not being allowed. That's the to when you're working up to getting the surgery, you have to go on, I'm sure, uh, uh, some sort of plan before the surgery. So what is what would that look like? Yeah, again, as we put patients through the uh, preoperative preparation program, we're slowly helping them eliminate some of the negative parts of their diet. So for some patients, that may be sugar. For other patients, that may be fats. For other patients, that may be just how they eat. They may be skipping meals and eating large meals at the end of the day when it's least likely to be burned off. So um, I actually mentioned that patients can't have sodas. Um, sodas actually um, stretch out the stomach or stretch out mm -hmm. the intestinal tract and can actually undo some of the effects of the surgery long term if they continue to drink sodas. So sodas are one of the things that are on the hit list. The other thing that is really detrimental to weight loss patients is liquid calories, whether they're high sugar calories or a high uh, protein drink, such as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the protein supplements and protein, protein smoothies and drinks that we've all become accustomed to. Because our weight loss surgeries a big component of it include restriction, simply limiting how many calories you can get in. Well, liquids don't experience very much restriction. They can actually slip right past um, those small stomachs or slip right past those gastric bands, and patients have consumed quite a number of calories before they really feel full. So we encourage our patients to eat more normally. It should look like it came off of a tree or out of the ground. Um, and the more naturally you can eat with the fewer processed calories that you can get in your diet, the more likely you are to have success. Before we wrap it up, one more time, tell us about the uh, uh, bi-monthly program that you give, and it's at the, the hospital. Tell yes. us about that. Yeah, um, so it's a free seminar open to the public. If anybody's interested in signing up, um, all they need to do is go to dchweightloss.org or uh, they can call the office at 240-965-4405. And they simply sign up and they can come in and attend a free seminar. It's offered twice a month. I will be the speaker and I'll be happy to go over all aspects of obesity and uh, obesity treatments, including non-surgical treatments. But of course, I do focus on the surgical options 
discuss the full spectrum of options within surgery and go over some of the benefits, risks, and of course alternatives to weight loss surgery. What would be your best advice to someone who has been struggling with weight loss for years, but they're afraid because as we uh, discussed earlier, in the past, years ago, that surgery or the different type of procedures, they weren't as sophisticated Correct. as they are today. What would you say to alleviate those fears? I think the best um, way to alleviate fears is education. Educate yourself. Understand what your level of obesity is. So if you don't know what your BMI is, maybe consult with your primary care physician. Your primary care physician is also a wonderful, wonderful resource when it comes to understanding medical treatments for obesity. You may not be a candidate for surgery, but you still want to start to address your obesity. And sometimes that may mean diet and exercise. Other times that may mean medications. For the most severely affected, that typically means surgery. And once you understand your level of obesity and you understand the risk to you and your life, um, if weight loss surgery is an option, it's always good to come in, listen to the seminar, um, come in for a consultation. Only a qualified weight loss surgeon can tell you if you're a candidate for weight loss surgery or not. So educate yourself. Also, the final thing I always tell patients, go out and talk to patients who've had surgery before. That's why we open our um, support groups to pre-op patients as well. So they can come in and actually meet with patients who've been through the struggle and get their perspective and see exactly how did their lives change for the good and for the bad. And I think once they've digested all that information, they'll be better able to make a decision for themselves. I want to mention um, something we talked about off mic before we uh, started the show. You were saying that um, sometimes you've had the opportunity to actually treat families, which is so very important because usually it's a family thing because yes. the, the one person is cooking the food and the foods might not be as healthy as they should be and you'll find that the whole family has a weight issue. Yeah, that's correct. Unfortunately, obesity runs in families. And it's not really the genetics, so it's not the same model as, for example, so high not. blood pressure. Typically not. Um, mm. Unfortunately, we don't change our genetics so quickly that obesity can become an issue. Obesity typically is a matter of something that you mentioned, the way families eat. Typically, you learn almost anything from your parents, but certainly you learn how to eat and the, the types of foods that you may choose. Those are all things that you learn from your family, especially your parents. And so we have found in studies that if we can actually improve a patient's weight, for example, a parent, a mother, we actually have beneficial effects on the entire family. Um, the healthy foods are entering the house and the junk food's gone. Physical activity is at a, at a premium versus watching television or more sedentary activities. So we can break the cycle because we do know that unfortunately if obesity is allowed to be passed on to the next generation, they're at high risk of passing it on to the subsequent generation as well. What's the success rate in your opinion? So success is a difficult thing to determine. We, we like to determine success on a patient by patient basis. But if you use the more generally accepted definition of losing half your extra body weight. So again, if you're 100 pounds overweight, how many of those patients will lose at least 50 pounds? And again, early on, it seems to be about 80 to 90%. Um, longer term, that really depends on the individual patient. Um, as I mentioned, if you go as much as five years out, we start to see failure rates um, go up to about maybe 30%. So 70% of patients still have excellent results, but we start to see some of those results degrade over time. Great, I thank you so much for joining us. We've been talking about obesity, which is what the Sisters for Fitness organization is about. And you are the medical director of bariatric surgery at Doctors Community Hospital. As you mentioned several times, you all do uh, workshops or, or seminars. seminars twice a month for people who may be interested. People might want to come in and, and check it out. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You've been watching Sisters for Fitness, the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Have a great day.